journey through the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and we come to number five today, obviously Sardis. Now, there are a few things we've, we've uh, talked about in how we're approaching this, and I just want to remind us that these things, Jesus Christ revealed himself to these churches, not for just some time in the distant future, but for their time. He had a practical message for those churches who were extant in that day. Now that message, because it's scripture, also applies to us and to all the churches for all time. And I think you're beginning to see how though each church uh, is a particular problem is highlighted, these problems can exist in any church and every church in those days, in these days, and in the days to come. Uh, you will notice that there's a pattern, there's a rhythm that he follows through each church, and he ends each message in the same way. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear the message to the what? Churches. So each message is to an individual church, but each message is for every church. So it's the same as today, it hangs over. Now, let me just refresh our memory a little bit. In uh, Ephesia, in Ephesus, the church there, Jesus shows his disdain for a church that has works, but no love. And he tells them that that's not good. In Smyrna, he encourages a persecuted church. You remember they were really struggling under the, the, the arm of persecution. In Pergamum, he confronts an overly tolerant church. And in Thyatira, he chastens a compromising church. Now, in Sardis, he summons a complacent church. You ever see that <clears throat> little pogo cartoon? I think everybody's familiar with that. We have met the enemy and he is us. Well, that's what happens when we become complacent. We uh, become the enemy. Now, complacency doesn't sound so bad, does it? I mean, compared to those folks over in Ephesus, they were doing all this stuff w without a, any love component. And you remember in, in uh, Smyrna and Pergamum and those places, he talked about the devil's throne being there and all this idol worship and all that stuff going on. Now, being complacent doesn't sound so bad compared to that, does it? Seems like a rather innocuous thing. I mean, how many of us, you don't have to give a show of hands, but uh, how many people, if you just ask them out of the blue, would regard complacency even as a sin? Probably not. And I don't know that it is or not, but the results of it certainly are. And they are not good when it, complacency settles in to a church. Complacency is akin to cancer. As cancer is to the physical body, so complacency is to the spiritual body or to any, any entity, uh, whether it be a business, whether it be a marriage, whether it be a church. Once complacency sets in and it begins to eat away at things, things begin to deteriorate. And people begin to lose uh, what they thought they started out to do. Yeah, in an institution, uh, it may lose its focus on what it was originally meant to be. And that's what happens in a church also. Uh, we, we lose focus. What were we originally supposed to be doing as a church? Well, we're going to look at that as we go along. A couple of examples I share with you of institutions. Now, here's an institution that's a good, fine institution, but has totally lost its focus on what it was founded to do, and that is one we all know, and, there's no, and I, I like the institution, okay, it just doesn't do what it was founded to do, and that is the YMCA. In fact, if you ask uh, many people, what does YMCA stand for? They don't know. Do we know what it stands for? Young Men's what? Christian Association. It was founded as a Christian institution. But today, if you're part of that institution, you cannot talk about Christianity. It's completely lost its focus. Now, it still does good things. I'm not saying it doesn't. It does do good things. But its focus was to bring men in to Christ. Uh, here's another one. 
there was, there was a group of uh, college trustees gathered and they were going to write uh, a purpose statement for their school and they came up with this that said the purpose of getting an education at this institution above all else is going to be for young men to be founded in Jesus Christ and understand that all of their learning and education is for the betterment of the gospel. Now those men were known as the trustees of Harvard. Now, that was Harvard's mission. That was Harvard's focus. That's what Harvard was founded to do, was to prepare people to share Jesus Christ. Would you say they've lost their focus? Okay. Okay. Dartmouth, Yale, Princeton, almost all of our colleges that have been around for any length of time were founded for the purpose of preparing people to share Jesus Christ. Brown University, probably the most liberal university in our country. By the way, Brown has this thing now, it's called Naked Week. And it is just what it says. If students want to go naked, they can go naked. Amazing. Brown University was founded by a group of clergymen to provide a liberal arts education centered on Christ. You think they might have lost their focus a little bit? You know, they're still educating people. You can still get a good education there. But they lost their focus. Now, how did they do that? Do you suppose they're going along, they're all focused in on Christ, they're all focused in on preparing uh, people uh, with the scripture and, and that and a solid foundation, and all of a sudden one day somebody just stood up and said, we don't want to do that anymore, we want to do this. Of course not. It happened over time as the powers that be became complacent to what they were called to do. And it's the same in every institution. Once that sets in, if it's not arrested, the institution will lose its focus. It may still do good things, but we know from the message to the church in Ephesus that merely doing good things misses the point, doesn't it? Yeah. What about in a marriage? What causes most marriages to fail? Now, you can come up with a lot of things. And there's usually an, an end thing, a straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will, or whatever. But way before they reach that point, complacency sets in. And you, you find that the husband and the wife, or the husband or the wife, usually it's both, they don't do the things they used to do. You remember Jesus talks a little bit about that to some of these churches. He says, remember... And isn't that true? I mean, think about it. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you, husbands, treat your wives as you treated them the day you married them? I hope many of you can say, I, I do. And the same for you wives. You remember how when you used to date, the little things you'd do, and you couldn't wait to be together, and, you know, you'd tell each other how every day you love each other, and all that sort of thing? Well, here's, here's what happens to us. If we do, it doesn't have to happen, but here's what we let happen to us so many times. We forget one day, and well, I just forgot one day, and so then we let it slide to two days and three days, and, and pretty soon it's not really important anymore, and we forget that, and it's kind of a downward thing. Now, and it doesn't usually happen like this. It usually happens over time. Same thing in a church. Same thing uh, in, a, in a commercial organization. Over time, as we forget to do the things that brought us together in the first place, as we get our eyes off of the goal, we just begin to drift. It's not bad people doing bad things. It's good people not doing the best things is what causes this. The first step in this drift is to become complacent about the main mission. It is to fail to be vigilant. It is to fail to guard our hearts and keep our minds focused on Christ. Well, let me give you a little background here into Sardis. Uh, 
At one time, Sardis was the crown jewel of the Lydian Empire. Turkey and all of that used to be the Lydian Empire, and we may have a slide, we do. And you see it covered a lot of territory. Lydia was a, was a powerful place uh, in, in the world at one time. And Sardis was the capital of Lydia, the main city. And Sardis was the crown jewel of that, imp of that empire. Here's what Herodotus, the, the great Greek historian, says about the Lydians. He says, the Lydians were famously rich and said to live sumptuously, even to the point of being dangerously softened. Now he's talking of a few hundred years before uh, our setting here, but uh, they were a great nation, they were a rich nation. Uh, and Sardis was the, the crown jewel of all these riches. Sardis, you see, was blessed with an abundance of gold. How many of you would like to have that problem? Yeah, I mean, they had an abundance of gold. In fact, Sardis is the first place where gold coins were actually minted, and silver also. Uh, they, they were the pioneers in that. How many of you have all heard of King Midas? Midas Touch, you know? Well, the story is fictional, but there really was a King Midas and he was king in Phrygia. And the, as the, the, the story goes in relationship to him and Sardis, the reason Sardis had so much gold is because, you remember Midas, you know the story? King Midas, you know, he had, everything he touched turned to gold, that was what he wanted. Well, but then he found out when he touched people he loved, they turned to gold too, and that wasn't good. So he wanted to get rid of this thing. So the way he got rid of the Midas touch is he went to Sardis. And in Sardis he bathed in the springs and the, the golden touch was washed off into the water. And that's why there's supposedly there's so much gold in Sardis. Good little story. But uh, these things are, are interesting how they come about. So we've got this, this place that's really blessed. They're doing well. Uh, everything's going great. And in 560 BC a guy by the name of Croesus becomes the king. And Croesus is one of these guys that's just got it all going on. He's a good administrator, he's got a good military mind, he's, he's, he's able to rally people to his cause, and, and Sardis is just doing great. He expands the empire, he enjoys uh, many military successes, and amasses all of this wealth and power that the more he gets, the more it allows him to have even more success. But as is often the case, the very things that allow us to have success can sow the seeds for our downfall, can't they? When we begin to depend on them and we become blinded to other things that are going on. And this is what happened to Croesus. He began to think that uh, he was undefeatable. Well, there's this big power rising up in the east. And we know who that is. It's the Persians, right? And they have a king that we all know from our Old Testament, and that's Cyrus. And so Cyrus is coming up over here, and Lydia is over here, and it's kind of evident that eventually they're going to clash. So Croesus, all full of himself, goes up to the, to the oracle at Delphi, and he asks, he says, I want to go out and come against Cyrus, what do you predict will happen? Well, as oracles often are, it's not real specific. And here's what they told him. They said, if you go out against Cyrus, a great empire will fall. That's all he said. So Croesus, full of himself, okay, that means the Persian Empire is going to fall. Let's go. Well, we all know the Persian Empire survived. And Croesus was defeated, Lydia fell, and Sardis was made a part, Sardis and all the rest of Lydia was made a part of the Persian Empire. Point being, don't get so full of yourself that you aren't looking around at other things. There are other things that might be going on. Well, ancient commentators blamed Lydia's ultimate fall 
on a battle that took place at Sardis and they blame that upon, of all things, complacency. Complacency. So not only is complacency in the church, but the seeds of complacency were sown in the community hundreds of years before. So now, it's, it, it's 600 years later. And now we're right here into our time. And Jesus is saying to this church, your problem is you've gone to sleep. Oh, so I, I should tell you, I guess, at least I'm interested in this stuff. <laughs> Maybe you're not. But the, the way Sardis fell, uh, Cyrus defeated the empire of Lydia, but Croesus retreats to Sardis, and Sardis is a huge fortress, and it, it has an acropolis on it, and on three sides, the sheer rock walls, 1,500 feet high, natural. And so they determined that we only have to guard the front, because the other three sides are impenetrable. Nobody can get up there. So they only guarded the front. Well, you can probably guess what happened. The Persians are pretty sharp individuals. Uh, you remember uh, Darius, uh, Cyrus's predecessor, uh, went into Babylon, the story of the handwriting on the wall, you know. And while Belshazzar's in there having a big party, they divert the water under the walls. That's the end of Babylon. Well, they're going to do virtually the same thing to Sardis, except uh, instead of uh, going under the walls, they send guys up, hand over hand, over the wall. And once they got inside, it was a pretty short battle. But they didn't guard the walls because they thought the walls were impregnable. And that's how we become complacent. We think, I don't have to be vigilant in this area because that area will never cause me a problem. Oh, foolish fellow. You need to be vigilant on every front. Because when we drop our guard... We're setting ourselves up for failure. Now, remember, spiritual failure doesn't always look like what we think failure is. This church in Sardis, as we're going to see, looked really good. They were doing good stuff. But they weren't doing what they should have been doing. So how does Jesus reveal himself to these folks? He says this, in verse 1, to the angel of the church of Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Gee, does that sound familiar? Ephesus? Almost the same words. The angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, there's some real parallels here between Ephesus and Sardis. Here is a church in Sardis with a good reputation in the community. They, they're, they're known to, to be loving. Uh, they're, they're probably known to go out and do good things in the community. They run social programs. Uh, they're involved. Their folks were busy. Uh, the thing was a large church. If you were in Sardis, the go-to church was this one. It looked fantastic. They were busy. They had just forgotten the main thing. They had forgotten what they were in Sardis to do. Again, let me emphasize, these are not bad people doing bad things. These are good people doing good things. They just aren't doing the main thing. Which begs the question, what is the main thing? Well... In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we can see what the main thing is. This is when the church was first, first being founded. And the main thing, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. That was the main thing. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. Now, I'm all for doing things in the community. I'm all for reaching out. We do everything we can do in, in those lines. And it's all good stuff. And we need to be doing those things. But you know what? 
if we aren't devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching, if we aren't spending time fellowshipping together, if we aren't spending some time in prayer, we're missing the main thing. And what, what is the apostles' teaching? Well, it was given to them by Jesus. And what did he tell them to do? Go into all the world and make disciples. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, we can't all go to Africa. We can't all go to Asia. Some of us are never going to leave here. So we need to be making disciples here. We need to be inviting people. You just think, however, however big our number is, you, you just pick a number. If everybody invited one person to church and they came, in a year you double. See? If they stay. If they don't stay, you aren't making disciples. Uh, so the invitation is just the first part. But let me show you the results of their being devoted to the main thing here. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now that sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? That's the main thing. That's the main thing. And the main thing produced a great and vibrant church. Now in Sardis, we have them doing all the good stuff, but they're not doing the main thing. Jesus says to them, I have the seven spirits, and we talked about that number seven and how significant it is in the book of Revelation. It means uh, he has all power, it's limitless, he's all-knowing, it's present everywhere, he's almighty. He talks about the seven stars, the headship over all the churches. Jesus is saying what you folks lack is the Holy Spirit, and I have what you need. Right? I'm walking among you, I can see what you're missing, and I have it here, right here in my hand. But he needs to get their attention first. Revelation chapter 3 verse 2, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Notice there's something missing here that was present in all the other four churches that we've dealt with up to this point. Remember with all the others, he starts out with a con commendation and he says, I know this about you and that about you and this is good and this is good. And then he says, but I have this against you. He doesn't say that here. There's no but I have this against you. There's a simple call, wake up! And strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have... Now notice this, he doesn't find their works bad. He says, I have not found your works complete. So in other words, you're doing these works, you're doing this stuff. But you're not getting to the main thing. In Sardis, we have no Balaam-like prophet. In Sardis, we have no Jezebel figure leading the people astray. In Sardis, there's no seed of Satan. In fact, the letter mentions no external source of intimidation whatsoever. There is no social rejection as there was in Pergamum. There's no idol worship as there were in the others. At Sardis, the problem was completely internal. The problem at Sardis was complacency. They'd become complacent about their spiritual lives and their lost focus. The result was a vacuous worship, an ineffective witness, 
and a shift from a God-centered life to a self-centered life. To this church, Jesus says, wake up! Because you're drifting. Now, as always, he doesn't leave it there. He tells them what they need to do. Verses 3 and 4. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Well, here's the corrective action. Three things. First is, remember. Second is keep. Third is repent. So, remember what? Remember what they had heard. And what had they heard? They had heard the gospel. And he says, remember the gospel. Remember the apostles' teaching. They were trying to do in the flesh what can only be done in the spirit. You see, you can put on a really good show, and if Christ isn't the centerpiece of that show, it's no good. So remember the apostles' teaching. Keep. Keep what? Same answer. The gospel. Keep it. Live it. Share it. The gospel. Calvin said that the mission of the church is to make the invisible kingdom of God visible to the world. That's a great quote. That's your job, because you're the church. I'm the church. We're the church. You banner. That's what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be making the invisible kingdom of God visible to the world. <coughs> Jesus says, third thing, repent. In other words, change direction. Correct the shift. You can do it. You can do it. If you see complacency in your life, wherever that may be, in your church, in your work life, in your marriage, wherever it is, change it. Fix it. You can. You don't need a miracle. You just simply need to wake up. That's what Jesus says. Wake up while there is still time. Because he says, if you don't, I'm just going to kind of come in like a thief in the night. Which is, you know, the difference between a thief and a robber is a, a robber uses force, a thief uses stealth. And so Jesus said, I'm just going to kind of come in, you're not even going to know it. And I'm just going to take away what you have left, which isn't much. Your candlestick, he calls it in other places. And you'll just go ahead and continue to die. Now, you may have a lot of people, you may have a lot of money, you may have a lot of whatever, but you're going to continue to die. I was at a conference years ago in Phoenix, put on by an entity called the Alban Institute. And uh, there were churches from, from all over the country and all different denominations and that. And I was talking with this one guy from some church back east. And he said, yeah, we had to, somebody die of... 30 years ago or whenever it was, 20, 30 years ago, and they left the church an endowment worth millions and millions of dollars. And I said, well, that'd be cool. And he says, no, it's terrible. He says, because our people have become complacent. They don't give of their own money because the church, they know the church doesn't need it. The church is going to be there whether they give or not. And when they quit giving of their money, pretty soon their hearts are gone too and they lose interest and they come and they go and they have their little social club. But we're dead. We become complacent. So he says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to go ahead and just let you die. Now he says, though, in verse 4, there's some good news. Yet, you still have a few in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. 
So within any group, even a group that is 90% complacent, there are 10% that aren't. Isn't that right? So here's what your mission is if you are complacent. Look around and find those that aren't. And when you find one, you identify them. You look around and you find somebody that, well, they're not complacent. They're, their spirits are high. They're into this thing. They're doing what they can do. And then you associate with them. Because you will become like who you align yourself with. And so, here's what, here's what Satan would have us to do, and all too often he's successful. Who do we associate with? The complainer, the grumbler, uh, the person that just is always, oh, who is me? And we commiserate with them. And what happens? Well, we get infected, don't we? And pretty soon we start. Those of you that have been in business and positions of, of being the boss, you've seen it happen with employees. Good employees get infected with that. And down they go. All pastors have seen it. Good Christian men and women get infected with that disease and down they go. Jesus says, don't. Wake up. Find the people that have got it going on. Find the people that are spirit-filled, that are excited, that see the good in things and associate with them. Align yourself with them. And then after you do that, emulate them. You see. I heard a sermon years ago, and I don't remember who, who preached it to give them credit, but they said this about us as Christians. Too many Christians are thermometers. Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat. Now what's the difference? A thermometer merely reflects the temperature around it. A thermostat affects the temperature around it. It changes it. You see. And that's what we want to be. And if we're not, let's find one, associate with them, and we will become one. Remember, there's an old axiom that's true. Like attracts like. So look at somebody who is the person you would like to be like and associate with them. Emulate them. Well, what if we do? What are the results? Verses 5 and 6. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I'll never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The result will be revival. It will be a Spirit-led church, a powerful church. That's what happened in the 16th century. We call it the Reformation. Remember the church had become complacent, it had become dead. It, just, it was just not very good at all. And here we have the guy, you know, the bright... Morning Star, we have, and we have Martin Luther come along. And he pulls this thing off called the Reformation. And what was the Reformation? It was above everything else, it was a return to Scripture, a return to the Apostles' teaching. Sola Scriptura, Scripture only. That's where we need to go, that's where our roots need to be. That's why we as a church at Parkside cling to the theology of the Reformation. But Reformation must be an ongoing process. It must continue. You must constantly be going back into this book, looking at the Apostles' teaching, examining yourself to see if you are where you ought to be. God knows that about us. That's why he says things uh, like in Romans 12 too, by the renewing of your minds. Your mind needs to constantly be renewed and refreshed. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. We need to continually be refilled with God's Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing process. Yet once you ever come to the point, you say, I've arrived, you're done. Because you'll start that backward slide. It's a continual thing. So, uh, his message to the church in Sardis is 
Don't be complacent. And that message goes for us today. It's interesting to me. The mightiest men of the Revelation, or of the Reformation, the denominations that are founded under their name, have all lost focus. And they've, they've simply become social clubs. We don't want to do that. We want to continually refocus, continually renew, continually refresh. And then when Jesus walks among us, he'll be pleased. Pray with me. Lord, thank you uh, for this message to the church at Sardis. And Lord, how many Sardisian, if that's a word, churches are there today? Many. Lord, we pray that we don't become one of them. Help us to be about the business of sharing the gospel. Because everything else we do, though they are good things, they are needful things, they are helpful things, they aren't the main thing. Yes, we need to be about doing them. But we need to be about inviting people into our lives, into our church, into your kingdom. Because we are the instruments you have chosen to work through. So Lord, revive us, refresh us, enliven us. Help us, Lord, to, especially as we go into this wonderful holiday season, to really be vessels of your grace. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.